Hi, everyone. This is America Adapts, the climate change podcast. Hey, Adapters. Before we get started, I want to give a little background. California Adapts Episode 1, The Storytellers, is the first in a three-episode series. If you are a new listener to America Adapts, these episodes are also available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and just about any podcast app you use. First off, I'd like to thank the UCLA Institute of Environment and Sustainability for their generous sponsorship of this series. This entire series was produced by scientist turned filmmaker Randy Olson. More information will be available at the end of the episode. So let's get started and see how California is adapting to climate change. In early December of 1861, there were really two floods back to back. Of course, you had the state capital here. You had Sacramento uh, right there sandwiched between the American River and the Sacramento River. And to the north, you had cities like Yuba City and Marysville starting to crop up. And that's those, they were feeding both the miners as well as the agricultural, the, the very rapidly growing agricultural interests in the valley. So down come these waves of water. Uh, flood water. I mean, it didn't let up for almost two months, which is an extraordinary period of time here. And it, it, we don't know how many people killed, but it could have been thousands. And it killed most of them right here. And this is where people really got whacked near, near Sacramento. I'm standing next to Jeff Mount. He's a geologist with the University of California, Davis, and is telling me about the worst climate-related disaster to strike California so far. Welcome to this three-part special for America Adapts. We're going to take a look at California. How's it doing for climate adaptation? In this first episode, I'll bring you three stories to set the stage. First, Jeff Mount will tell us the stunning details of the great 1861-62 flood that washed out Sacramento. It was so massive it created a lake down the center of the state that was 300 miles long and 20 miles wide. California has seen nothing like it since, but the experts know it will come again, possibly soon. The second story, how Los Angeles managed to overcome its smog problem, shows the strength and determination of the state when it comes to protecting the environment. And the third story will take us right up to the present on the subject of climate change with Governor Jerry Brown's dramatic press conference last June 1st in response to President Trump's withdrawal from the Paris Climate Accord. Now let's go back to 1861. This is 40% of the area of California. When you count the valley and the mountain and the, and the watersheds around it, and all of it drains to one tiny little spot. The second aspect that makes it a perfect flood machine is the mountains themselves are oriented in a north-south direction. That means the face of the mountain is broadside to the Pacific storms. I mean, this is the source of our moisture. This is perfect for making floods. So there was already a system which was charged by having a lot of snow on the ground and a lot of water in the shallow part of the ground, and the soils are all saturated. And then it turned from cold and snowy to tropical. And this is the key aspect of what we have here is is people call them pineapple expresses they've got different names for them but now we call them what are called atmospheric rivers so it went from being very cold in the early part of December and all you know accumulation of immense amount of snow on the ground and, and water in the soil to shifting to subtropical conditions it warmed up a lot now that helped melt the low elevation snow, not the high elevation, but melt the low elevation snow. But what came with that was your worst nightmare of a weather pattern set in. By early December, the Native Americans had left. They knew what was coming. And they remember, they lived in this valley for 10,000 years, and they, they were probably pretty good at telling when things were going to go go south. They, they didn't build cities along rivers. You know, they, they built motorhomes is the best way to describe them. Oop. There's going to, it's flood season, we should just move. And so they moved, and, and they were hunter-gatherers. There's not a, not a lot of agriculture in here. So they picked up and left, and this is historians have confirmed this, that they, they knew something bad was going to happen, and they, they left. 
But of course, this is all Europeans now here who didn't know any better. And, had, and being that rivers have, are you know, a source of irrigation, but a source of transportation and drinking water and your sewage, it's where you dumped your sewage, rivers were everything. So down come these waves of water, uh, flood water. All of these watersheds are delivering all their water to the Sacramento River on, in, the, in the north end of the valley, in the San Joaquin, in the south end of the valley, and just absolutely overwhelmed those rivers. And so at Christmas, things started to fail. And what was happening is that water was coming at the capital from two directions. And it wiped towns off the map all over the I mean wiped them off and the foothills they, they, there's these little mining towns that cropped up all over the foothills and when the when the flood waves came down and they do operate like a wave and these waves would come down and just strip the hillside clean take take everybody massive landslides in some of, in some of the mountains mountain areas by Christmas of that year uh, you had had major damages associated with flooding. Yuba City, Marysville, almost completely destroyed. Uh, and then, of course, here, the state capital, Sacramento, which, again, is, is it's, it's, I guess it's a really dumb location for a capital. Uh, it's right here at the confluence between two very big and very dynamic rivers that rise and fall really fast. And it came in and started flooding in Sacramento, and it flooded all over the place turned right around and started raining harder still, I mean, much harder still in early January. And so by the 10th of January, which was the inauguration day for Leland Stanford, uh, he was going to be the new governor. He was elected in November, uh, just before all of this started. He was going to be inaugurated. Sacramento was underwater, completely underwater. In some places, depths of water were 30 feet and that takes some explanation how it could be that deep, but it's yeah. I mean, it was it was it was almost entirely underwater, except for where the Native Americans who had normally have had their villages, which were up on the hills. We've got we do have hills in Sacramento, uh, and that's actually where the really nice houses are. Uh, and back then, that's where the, the 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 people with money would build their houses is up on those hills. But it was underwater, and of course, the epic story is that that uh, Leland Stanford got in a rowboat and rode to the capital, which was not entirely underwater, but was surrounded entirely by water at that time, went up, was inaugurated, and got back in his rowboat. And by the time he got back to his house, he couldn't get in it um, on the first floor. He had to go in through the second floor to his, to his mansion. And the mansion is still here in Sacramento. Uh, and then the legislature gave up and moved to San Francisco until the waters receded and then the legislature came back. It was pretty epic here. So that was California's first major introduction to a climate that can be fickle and lethal. The state lost a half million lambs and a quarter of all cattle as William Brewer of the California Division of Mines and Geology wrote that, nearly every house and farm over this immense region is gone. America has never seen such desolation by flood. But here's the most disturbing thing about that story. It's not like the great floods of 1861 and 1862 were a fluke. The problem is there's an epilogue. There's multiple epilogues to this story uh, about this flood that you have to keep in mind. Because this valley is not just shaped as a valley, as a natural feature uh, by floods, but life in the valley is shaped by floods. And so the cities themselves are shaped by floods. Um, And the moment we forget that, uh, and we have forgotten in the past, they come up to bite us. But following all of that, so people, the, the traditional approach to flooding, and this is true everywhere and is happening this year in, in Houston and everywhere else, is you get up, you dry yourself off, you rebuild, you say we got to do something about flooding, and you move on. And so they then started building levees. So we now have ringed ourselves with levees, uh, and if the 1861-62 flood were to come again today, uh, the damage would be epic. It would exceed anything we've seen in history in the U.S. The only problem is the process of making their levees bigger, they're building lots more houses behind those levees. And there are two kinds of levees, those that have failed and those that will fail. 
we're talking on the order of $750 billion worth of damage and thousands of deaths, maybe even tens of thousands of deaths, if the 1861-62 flood were to come here. And the reason is, is we built this system here to meet a federal standard for flood management. And it's a very weak standard. So if 1861-62 were to come through Sacramento today, you and I would be having a very different conversation. Uh, we would be talking about the scope and scale of damages in the hundreds of billions of dollars. I mean, dwarfing Katrina in terms of costs. All we can say is the deck is stacked, dice are loaded, whatever you want to say, the, to increase the likelihood of that happening. I've lived in California my whole life, and I know that the climate is different, that the, that the seasons are different, that everything seems even slightly askew, you know, as if they've all shifted a month or so beyond their normal date where you would expect them to be. It's Sunday morning, and we're here at the Farmer's Market in Hollywood, California. With me is Aliyah Jasmine, formerly of MTV News. What do you think is the biggest issue that you're dealing with in this city right now when it comes to climate change? Uh, the, you know, that's a good question. We've got, uh, we've got major issues right now. We have fires and droughts, flooding, uh, things you'd never imagine possible. And then you're trying to pretend like the weather isn't a factor when it's 90 degrees at Thanksgiving and it's getting warmer. And um, so for that, it's almost the anticipation of when we don't have water anymore and what you're seeing in South Africa and what we're going to have when you have over a million, a hundred million trees that are dead that we've been discussed because of the disease there and what's going to happen pretty soon. Californians tend to know a lot about their environment. They've traditionally led the nation in environmental protection. Jeff Mount told me that the Great Flood produced the state's first environmental lawsuit in 1882. It was to end the mining that had produced the gravel that had choked waterways, causing much of the flooding. Since that initial lawsuit, there have been countless battles to protect the state's environment. About the most dramatic of all battles took place in the 1970s with a decades-long struggle to end the smog problem that was choking Los Angeles. I want to take some time to tell that epic story for one main reason to show the willpower of California's people when it comes to environmental issues. This will help us understand how seriously they now take the challenges to their climate. To tell the story, I've got two great guests. One is a grassroots activist. The other could be called a political activist. One works with the media. The other works within the political system. Our grassroots activist is the actor Ed Begley Jr., star of everything from the 80s medical drama series St. Elsewhere to his current recurring role on the popular AMC show Better Call Saul. In addition to acting, he's legendary for his environmental activism. The political activist is Mary Nichols, longtime leading force of California's clean air movement, and I mean like going back to the 1970s. Because they've worked together countless times over the decades, I've asked them to introduce each other. Mary, can you tell me how serious Ed is about his environmental efforts? Ed Begley Jr. is a committed environmentalist. I know quite a few uh, entertainers and people who are activists uh, from the industry side who have been very involved in support for national uh, and local uh, environmental causes and done it in a very positive, very sincere way. But I don't think there's anybody who would match Ed in terms of the length uh, uh, of their commitment to the cause. He has consistently showed up given his time, used his uh, ability to speak effectively on behalf of environmental issues, and done it at the local level without uh, making it something that was uh, just a trend. Okay, Ed, you've worked with Mary on environmental projects for decades. What can you tell us about her? Mary Nichols is a dear friend of mine. She's a champion of clean air for decades and decades. If I could ever do a fraction of what she's done, with her activism. She's so knowledgeable about these matters. She knows where all the levers of power and all the pressure points are to do things effectively because I'm just tugging away on these levers myself and they won't budge. And 
there's a smaller one over here that works all the better, and Mary knows it. She's so smart. She's a great resource, and she's done great things for the state of California. Jerry Brown has great respect in her, and as do I, as does everybody in the environmental community. So you grew up in Los Angeles. How bad was the smog when you were a kid in the 1960s? It hurt my lungs. It would hurt when you ran. It would hurt when you sat. It just hurt all the time. Like 200 plus days a year was so bad it hurt just sitting. 100 some odd days a year, there'd be some rain or wind or something that would help a little bit. It wouldn't be as bad. But it was horrible choking smog. And that's what led me to be what people now call an environmentalist. I got involved in 1970 because of 20 years of living in that smog. Well, the smog was hideous. First of all, it was a weird color, um, sort of an orangish color, which now we know is nitrogen oxides, but at the time I didn't know which component it was. And uh, it was like a thick blanket that basically covered the whole basin. So you dropped down into it as you came over the pass uh, into Los Angeles. And uh, and it also had a very distinctive smell, which was um, some kind of a chemical smell that really was a part of what made it so noticeable that there was something wrong. There were so many times we called it quits or would start walking and go, some reason we just go, I'm tired. That was the word we used for it as young people and teenagers. I'm just tired, let's go back home. We didn't really, we, I, mean, I knew my lungs hurt. I, didn't, I wasn't unaware of that, but I didn't put it together. I just go, I'm tired. Why didn't you guys, I thought you go in the bowling alley. No, we're tired, Mom. You know, and me and my friend Dave Goodman would just you know, walk back to the house. We wouldn't make it to the bowling alley, and it wasn't that long of a walk. We didn't intellectualize it much, to be honest. In uh, the 70s, the, there, oh, actually this goes back even further to the 1950s, they graded uh, smog by the severity of the readings of ozone. That was the primary uh, pollutant that, that people were concerned about. And um, a stage three was the worst, and it was considered to be uh, a, an episode that was so severe that everybody would need to stay indoors, not be outside, not breathing the air. People talked about it very little because they didn't think there was anything they could do about it. They really didn't think they could fix it. So they didn't talk about it much. I literally didn't know in my earliest years what was hurting my throat. It somehow coincided with me taking a drink from a, a water fountain or a hose or something. I thought there's something in the hose, the plastic of the hose, or in the chlorine in the water or something. People talked about chlorine. So I thought it had to do with the water because I'd be drinking a lot of it on a hot day and I, I didn't get it. And then finally somebody said, no, it's the smog. We were burning our trash in our backyards, not in a scoff law manner. We weren't breaking the law. Everybody had an incinerator. You were asked or required to have an incinerator. You put your tin cans and glass out in the street. They took that. But the rest is supposed to burn. And there was very few plastics back then. But there were some were burning plastics and paper and God knows what, burn anything you could in an incinerator in our backyard. This in a big thermal inversion valley, that you know, the Southern California Air Basin, you know, with the, the, the thermal inversion lid on the top of it, it was madness. Uh, one of our major uh, pollution sources back in those days was the old Kaiser steel plant. And it was just a filthy old plant. I mean, it had been built during World War II. It was put up in a slapdash hurry because the uh, military needed steel. There was a, there's a reason why it was there and why it was what it was. But in fact, um, you know, people thought it should be cleaned up. The major villain was identified as being the automobile. And although back in those days, we actually had a couple, a couple of auto plants in the L.A. basin. Uh, there were both a Ford and a GM plant here. When I moved out here in the early 1970s, there was a sense that um, the companies were resisting using better technology. And probably that came from com conversations that Kenny Hahn had with um, people out here who were in the world of science, technology, and people in, in the Caltech or UCLA who said, you know, this is something that could happen if the companies were willing to do it. Ken Hahn was a member of the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors for 40 years. He was one of the first Los Angeles politicians to get active in addressing the smog problem. He wrote letters to the heads of all the big auto companies, the CEOs, basically telling them that their products were causing problems and he wanted them to do something about it. And 
he got letters back from all of them saying, oh, no, no, it's not us. It's somebody else. It's not it's really not the cars. Our cars are are very clean. And I think that was actually the beginning of the drama around, you know, was California going to be able to actually force uh, these companies to make their products cleaner? They certainly knew that it wasn't natural now that I think about it. But they kind of said, look, we don't want smog either, but smog goes with prosperity. You know, smog is an unfortunate side effect of prosperities. You got to drive around in cars. You know, you got to have buses burning diesel. You got to have these power plants. But the, the buses and the cars and what have you were so dirty, they didn't have to be that dirty. The power plants didn't have to be that dirty. It wasn't until the 70s and the Clean Air Act, you know, signed by Nixon of all, bits of irony, you know, the raving environmentalist that is Richard Nixon, he signed the Clean Air Act and then reluctantly signed the Clean Water Act. Mary, I know you became part of the first administration of California Governor Jerry Brown. Can you tell me about the first time you ever met him? I remember very clearly the first time I met Governor Brown was at his home in Laurel Canyon, and it was shortly after the election, so it would have been late November, early December. It was clear that Jerry Brown was very serious about wanting to take action on air pollution. He was convinced that it was a problem that could be dealt with if only we could get uh, the auto companies to clean up their products and bring us cleaner cars and also clean up the power plants and oil refineries. He thought the local agency that was responsible for air pollution control, which was under the county board of supervisors, wasn't doing a very good job. And um, he thought that he could do better. Tell me about the first time you ever met Governor Brown. I was invited to go to his house to meet with him. I got the call from an intermediary uh, saying that the governor would like to talk to me. He was at his home at that point. His uh, residence was in Laurel Canyon. I was living one canyon over in the Hollywood Hills with a brand new baby. My husband was at work. It was a Saturday, but he was a litigator, so he often had to come in to the office on Saturdays. And this is before cell phones, remember. So I tried him at the office. I couldn't reach him. I had to call. I finally decided uh, that I had to call my neighbor across the street, who I really didn't know very well, but um, explaining to her that, you know, I had this brand new baby who at that point was uh, a month old. And uh, I had to go to an interview with Governor Brown. And she said, oh, no problem. My daughter knows Jerry from the ashram. I'll be happy to look after the baby. (laughs) I figured, okay, I'd be there for, you know, maybe uh, 20 minutes or so. And so uh, I drove off to uh, the address in Laurel Canyon. Uh, It was just an ordinary looking hillside house in L.A. Uh, There was somebody, a a highway patrol officer sort of stationed by the front door, which was the only clue that, you know, anybody important might be there. So I walked in, Governor then Brown, uh, Governor-elect, he hadn't been uh, sworn in yet, um, was there. I don't think there was anybody else in the house. He was uh, seated at a on a couch in the living room, uh, surrounded by books, newspapers, magazines, et cetera, on a low coffee table. He invited me to come in, and about two hours later, I left having um, agreed to take the job on the Air Resources Board. So it was was a very memorable occasion. It was a, a fascinating conversation. He knew a lot. He asked a lot of questions. They were very probing questions. It was a fun conversation, Um, but I really didn't know until the very end that he was going to say, okay, so are you going to come, you know, be on the Air Resources Board? And I said, sure. So that was that. Ed, you were a pioneer in driving an electric car way before it was cool. Yes. So I did my part. I started driving an electric car in 1970, uh, but I was uh, an easy mark back in those days. There was no internet to check things on and, and so people would tell me something, I just believe it, you know. You know, you're making the same amount of pollution with that electric car, you just make it the power plant, right there in the valley. You're an idiot. No, are you sure? I th- thought it would be less. No, it's not less. Of course, it is less, even figuring the power plant, even the dirtier plant back in the day, because most of your charging is off peak. You're not adding, they're not building new power plants for most people who drive an electric car, unless you w- live, you know, you work at an all night donut shop 
or at a 24-hour pharmacy, you're going to sleep at night and work during the day, not the opposite. So you plug in at night, and uh, there's, there's, they're not like little Honda generators they turn on all the time. You know, it's a big power plant, so you're getting kind of a free ride in electricity that's otherwise being created. So, uh, and 25% of the gasoline used in a city like L.A. and pollution that comes from burning that gasoline comes from idling, you know, or slowing down, coming to a stop, sitting at a stop. 25%, so that's another efficiency with electric cars. And I reasoned, I went, one day I'm going to get those things called solar panels to put them on my roof, and I'm really going to make, you know, I'm going to have a clean, clean car. But I didn't drive them for years because I just thought, I'm making the same pollution because somebody told me that. Right. They thought I was crazy. They just thought me driving the electric car was crazy. You're not making any difference, you know. What are you, they're making the same pollution to power plant. You're just shifting the, from the tailpipe to the power plant. You're an idiot or you're crazy. That's, there wasn't a lot of support. People thought, and some other people, a few of them said, no, that's good that you're doing something. I, you know, I don't know that I can drive around a little golf cart around. I don't feel safe. And it was a traffic hazard. Now that I look back at it, it went like 20 miles an hour. You know, I didn't attempt to go on the freeway, obviously, but even on whatever street, Van Nuys Boulevard, you had to stay to the right, you know, the whole time and not people honk at you. But people would get mad about smog issues. It was a, you know, kind of, it, it tapped into something get mad in ways that you didn't expect. I was walking down Santa Monica Boulevard with my friend Michael Richards. He played Kramer on Seinfeld. We had a comedy routine, and we were, not to get any laughs at this point, but we were wearing masks. I had several smog masks, you know, gas masks that I wore. And so we both had one because it was a particularly smoggy day, and we're walking down Santa Monica Boulevard near La Brea, and some guy pulls up in a big belching Cadillac. Hey! What? I'm sorry, what, what? What do you think you're doing? What are you jokers doing? Nothing. We're just, we're just walking down the street. You know, pull the gas mask and ask to, off to talk to you. You think you're cute, huh? No, I don't think I'm cute. There's smog. I mean, you've got a belching car here. Oh, shut up. He drove away. He was just, he engaged us. He was pissed that we were walking along with, we didn't have any signs like banned Cadillacs or whatever he was driving. You know, uh, one of the things that made me get interested in the problem of smog in the first place was that I realized that it was um, kind of a classic case where some people were getting rich at the expense of other people's health. And the bottom line there is that it's a problem that can be solved with technology. And technology is something that relates to money. It's about investment and whether you're going to spend the money to uh, address whatever the problem is. So uh, it was pretty clear going back to the late 60s that there were technologies that existed in the laboratory that would add something to the price of a new car, maybe $50, maybe even $150, depending on whose estimates you believed. And of course, the auto companies always went with the highest possible number that they could get. But their answer was always, well, we could do it. They didn't say they couldn't do it. They said they could do it, but then people won't buy our cars because they'll be too expensive. And so once we were at that stage of the discussion, it was pretty clear that this was a situation where politics could actually work in favor of doing something that was good for people. One of the big steps forward was the invention of the catalytic converter for cars. I'll be quite honest with you, there were, the original ones were not good. They made you use more gasoline, they were not fuel efficient, they somehow made the cars use more gas, they cut down the mileage, and they had all these hoses and things and pumps to put the fumes back in the, into the crank case or something. I can't remember how it worked, but it was very complicated, it didn't work. Then somebody, thank God, thought of the catalytic converter and those kinds of devices, and everything changed, because right away, they cut down a lot in the, some of the worst pollutants. And they kept improving and improving, and things got better. But people, some people wanted to do something, and there was enough people that did that kept suing people. It was suing that really made the difference. You know, different groups, the Coalition for Clean Air and the American Lung Association, you know, sued the air district to clean up the air in L.A. for them to do what is it? And there's good people at the Air District. I'm not taking shots at them. They just felt beleaguered and they didn't feel they had 
the wherewithal to do it. But when a lawsuit was brought against them, they would say to the people who said they clean it, couldn't clean up the power plants or the cars or what have you, said, look, our hands are tied. We're being sued. We have to do this. We, you have to make these cars with catalytic converters for California. And pretty soon when they started making cars for California and other people saw that you could clean up the air, other cities that were, had polluted air wanted them and other states wanted them. And so they made, you know, they made California standards for the nation then in all the cars. The uh, population and economy of the country and in particular of California have grown dramatically since we started doing this work back in the early 1970s to the point where, and oddly, we've also not stopped driving. I shouldn't say oddly. It's just a fact that despite the fact that, you know, we have about uh, two and a half times the population, we have many more times uh, the vehicle miles traveled that we did uh, when we first started doing this work. So population has grown. The, we've become a much more urban state, but people continue to drive large distances, um, probably because of the high cost of housing. And, you know, people are living further away from where they work and they're driving uh, because they have to in, in uh, many cases. Yeah. And yet um, we now see that our air pollution is uh, at levels that were almost unthinkable then. We don't have any stage one alerts. We've never had a, a stage two or a stage three in the last decade. Uh, the cars that you can buy today, even the biggest uh, car that Detroit turns out, uh, still emits less than one one hundredth of what it would have if you had tried to buy it uh, back in the 1970s. Now, even with four times the cars, millions more people since 1970, they are as much, much cleaner than it was in 1970. I do find it frustrating that people don't remember the history of air quality in Los Angeles because it proves that even with big ticket items like that in a region as big as L.A. and the other cities that followed employing our, our small control rules and what have you, that you can do something, you can make a change. That's a big one. And we did that. And guess what? Businesses didn't go broke. People made money and there were jobs created making catalytic converters and combined cycle gas turbines and spray paint booths and all the different devices, you know, good insulation, energy saving thermostats, all that stuff that we did, it all worked. We were kind of hoping it would work and there it did. When I say uh, environmental resilience, what does that mean to you? Sustainability. Okay. And what about mitigation? Blank. What about um, mitigation? Oh, that nothing comes to mind. And what about mitigation? Uh, I don't know too much about mitigation. What if I say mitigation? Oh, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> So today, California still has some of the worst air quality in the nation, but nothing like the horrendous smog that was left behind in the 1970s. Jerry Brown left office in 1983. He was followed by two Republicans, then the Democrat, Gray Davis, who ran into problems with a recall that led to a rather well-known Republican challenger. Arnold Schwarzenegger, ladies and gentlemen. Unashamedly bringing showbiz to politics. Arnold Schwarzenegger chose the Jay Leno Tonight Show to announce he's running for office as he called on the people of California to oust the current governor. He is failing them terribly. And this is why he needs to be recalled. Mm -hmm. And this is why I'm going to run for governor of the state. I vigorously opposed uh, the recall and Governor Schwarzenegger's election. So uh, just about that time, I was offered a position as um, uh, head of the Institute of the Environment at uh, UCLA. So uh, they recruited me and I found it the timing was perfect. And I was excited about the opportunity to be on campus. I had a faculty appointment at the law school. I still do. I'm a visiting professor at UCLA Law School. And uh, during my time at um, UCLA, 
We moved into a brand new building. It was the first LEED certified building on the campus. We started an undergraduate major, which had not existed before. And the whole issue of sustainability really uh, became part of UCLA's uh, mission, which it had never been before. So it was a very interesting time to be on campus. But uh, after the legislature passed AB 32, which was the state's first foray into uh, climate change legislation, uh, the Air Resources Board once again was back in the headlines, this time because uh, the governor didn't think that they were doing a very good job with implementing this legislation, which he took a very personal interest in. So uh, long story short is that the um, chairman of the board was dismissed. It was a big brouhaha, and a partisan fight was about to break out with the legislature. I got a call from Susan Kennedy, who I had known in the Davis administration, asking me uh, if I would be willing to consider coming back into state government again. And I said, yes. What was your first meeting like with Arnold Schwarzenegger? I uh, had an interview with Governor Schwarzenegger before I uh, took the job. And uh, I I spent a, an hour in the smoking tent out in the courtyard of the Capitol, uh, you know, with Schwarzenegger puffing on a cigar. Uh, but interestingly, that whole conversation was really about uh, the issue of climate change and Schwarzenegger's interest and determination that California was going to be a leader in addressing this problem. He was quite close to a number of international leaders who uh, were beginning to focus on this problem. He was very close to Premier Campbell of uh, British Columbia, who was uh, similar to Schwarzenegger. He was a progressive conservative. Those two terms can be used together, and sometimes I think they can. Uh, and both of them uh, were very interested in environmental quality, but finding ways that were pro-business, pro-economic development that you could use to address uh, serious environmental problems. So both of them were big fans of cap and trade as a mechanism of creating a market mechanism for um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And when Schwarzenegger found out that I had been the head of the air program at US EPA when the first uh, cap and trade program in the country was rolled out, the acid rain trading program under the Federal Clean Air Act, um, he was very excited. And that was what we ended up talking about. That's how it worked. So I wanted to share this LA smog story here at the start to give you an appreciation of how the state has confidently dealt with major seemingly impossible environmental problems in the past and been successful. It's relevant because the state has taken the lead role in dealing with the ultimate daunting challenge of climate. This has become especially clear in the past year through the efforts of Governor Jerry Brown. Mary, you're still the head of CARB, the California Air Resources Board, a position you've held since 2007. Last June 1st, Governor Brown held a rather dramatic press conference just a few hours after President Trump shocked the world by announcing the U.S. would be withdrawing from the Paris Climate Accord. This uh, move by Trump makes no sense. It's going to hurt America, and it's going to cost jobs, not the reverse. How did that announcement come about? We knew for many weeks that uh, the Trump uh, people were having a very serious debate about whether or not the U.S. should withdraw from Paris with arguments on both sides. But it seemed pretty clear that the president himself was more inclined in the direction of uh, getting out of any kind of international agreement or any other commitment that had been made by President Obama. So we were prepared for the decision when it was announced. And uh, the governor was actually getting ready to leave for China. We were uh, at the airport when the, the decision actually was announced. And uh, I was with him because I was part of the party that went to China this year, this past year. And uh, so uh, we, we were prepared to comment at that time. Were you amazed that Governor Brown made the announcement? I thought that it was 
absolutely necessary that Governor Brown speak out uh, immediately after the Trump decision because there was really no one else in the country who was in a better position to comment on what a disastrous decision this was, not only for uh, the United States, but for the world. Uh, By the time that, that Trump was elected and taking that action, California had established itself through a series of actions uh, as a, as a world player on this topic, and Jerry Brown himself is someone who's recognized uh, at, at, and was in, in Paris as uh, as someone who could represent um, a very large number of people and a large swath of the United States economy that was saying. We want to deal with climate change. We think it's a disaster, and we want to do something about it. So this brings us to where we are today with California. The state's always been a leader for environmental protection, and now, thanks to Governor Brown, it's taken a lead role in addressing climate change. But what is the state's climate reputation actually based upon? There's two main ways to address climate change. The first is to try and stop what's causing the problem, which is excess carbon emissions. That element goes by the term mitigation, which, as we've heard from a few people on the street, is not exactly the most widely understood word. Mitigation is defined as reducing the severity, seriousness, or pain of something. Given the recent climate disasters the state has experienced with drought, fire, and flood, California knows plenty about pain, giving it good reason to work on mitigation. But there's also the second component, which is getting ready for what we know is coming. In the second episode, you'll hear one expert refer to the freight train of pain that it's too late to stop. Another will talk about how the state will look more and more like Baja, Mexico. The changes are coming, no matter how hard California's work on mitigation. So that calls for the second element, which is what this podcast is all about. Climate adaptation, getting ready for the changes. It's now time to hear from Dr. Peter Kariva, the director of UCLA's Institute of Environment and Sustainability, who are the co-sponsors of this three-part special for California. I asked him about these two elements. California is a leader on mitigation. There's fortunes to be made off mitigation. People will become billionaires off mitigation by inventing new energy sources. Adaptation is going to be much harder. People are not going to become billionaires off adaptation, and fortunes aren't going to be made. It's going to be a tougher slog. So when I think about adaptation to climate change for the state of California, it's it's almost biblical. You know, I, I think first about fire. And uh, just the last few months, we saw horrific fires and terrible um, suffering. The data are clear. Those are increasing, and the state has to adapt. I think about drought. Drought means massive crop failures in a state that is the major food producer for the world, and drought means shortages of drinking water for people. What are we going to do? How are we going to adapt to the shortage of of water? I think about flood. We've seen record floods and landslides uh, as a result of that. Once again, uh, all the evidence is that we haven't even seen the worst of that yet. And some more rainfall and some more record rainfalls and the floods are going to be much worse. I think about temperature in California. It's about heat waves. It is especially about urban heat waves where a concrete-laden lifestyle combined with the hotter temperatures puts children and the elderly at risk. Some adaptation has to be done about that. And I think about sea level rise. And sea level rise... It's complicated because it's not just about storm surge and the erosion of the coastline and houses and expensive houses falling into the ocean. It's also about saltwater intrusion. So some of the best farmland in California, the strawberries, California is the leading strawberry producer in the world. Saltwater intrusion is going to ruin those crops. So it's five key climate impacts that demand adaptation. Fire, flood, drought, temperature, heat waves in California, and sea level rise. And there we have it, the five key elements of climate adaptation for California. How's the state doing with them? 
That's the question we're going to set out to answer in the second episode of this three-part special for America Adapts that's written and produced by communication specialist Randy Olson, who we'll eventually hear from. In the next episode, I'll go out into the field with a fire captain. We'll view the devastation of the recent Thomas Fire, the worst fire in the history of the state. I'll visit Sacramento and hear how the state's managing its water resources coming off the four-year mega drought. I'll talk to climate experts about something called the arc storm scenario, the idea of another 1861 giant flood hitting the state. I'll walk around downtown Los Angeles with an expert on urban heat using a laser thermometer to see how the city is doing in trying to reduce its heat problems. And I'll stand on the coast in Santa Cruz, hearing from one of the state's top authorities on sea level rise and how it will impact coastal communities. One of the things I'm going to do that should be fun and interesting is to ask each of the 20 or so experts we talk to to give us a score for how the state is doing in adapting to change in their specific area. I'll ask them to offer up a score from 1 to 10, where 10 means that the state is ready for all the changes ahead, and 1 means a complete failure to prepare for the future. When my journey is done, in the third episode, I'll total up all the scores giving an overall snapshot of how the state is doing for the whole subject of climate adaptation. It should be interesting to see what emerges. So we know that California is a leader, and we know it's already facing serious climate challenges. Join me on the next episode of America Adapts to find out whether the state really is adapting to what we know is coming. And eventually, you know, we're, we're looking at a climate more like Baja, California. I have said that t- we have this freight train of pain coming at us that we can see. So shame on us if we don't get cracking on trying to make ourselves more resilient. But this is like a war. If we don't take action, millions of people will suffer. Okay, adapters, that is a wrap to the first episode of California Adapts. I hope you enjoyed it. Again, thanks to UCLA's Institute of the Environment and Sustainability for sponsoring the podcast. This three-part series was produced by scientist-turned-filmmaker Randy Olson. For more information on Randy, please see the show notes. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share with your friends and colleagues on social media. Those links are also in the show notes. If you are interested in doing a similar podcast project focusing on any number of topics related to climate adaptation, please contact me. My contact information is in the show notes or at the website americadapts.org. If you want to hear more about these adaptation stories, I speak at conferences, events, and to private groups. Don't forget to join the Facebook page and the Facebook community group. Okay, adapters, keep up the great work. And don't forget to download episode two of California Adapts.